2024 Oscar noms announced Marvel, rumored to have met with The Gosling. Our first look at The Bad Batch's final season, the Jurassic franchise isn't extinct just yet. Plus, Indiana Jones whips his way into the digital frontier. All of that and more on this week's Multiverse News. Welcome to Multiverse News, your source for information about all your favorite fictional universes. My name's Matthew Carroll, and on our panel today, we have Jay Sisson from Commute the Podcast. What's going on, Jay? Hey, I'm doing well. I'm finally shoveling out of the snow. I was trapped Ooh. in my house all week last week in this Oof. giant snowstorm. Wasn't able to go anywhere, but Ooh. I finally got out. We're, we're, we're rolling. We're back in business. It was like 40 degrees today, so it kind of melted. It, when you say you're snowed in, like you just couldn't, like the roads were impassable or like you literally couldn't leave your house? The roads were too dangerous to go out. Okay. I could, I okay. could leave my house, I guess, in an emergency, but it would have been right. hairy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so scary. Like you say that, and it sounds like I live in Alabama. It, it got cold enough this year. Like for two days, we we couldn't. Our roads were a little impassable too. But like, it feels like such a that feels like a horror movie to me. What you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we stocked Being, up beforehand. You know, we were well, ready. Good, 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 good. <laughs> and uh, Jay Scotty St. Clair over in California. Uh, you're, you're not having these issues, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, salutations. As a uh, current resident of the Bay Area, I'm not allowed to complain about weather in any, in any way, shape, or form. But, you know, I'm excited to be here. It's a big week, so. <laughs> it is a big week. Uh, Haley Hobbs, how you feeling today? Uh, I live in the Midwest, and you're all a bunch of pansies about your weather. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, superior. I see that. Yeah, I see yeah. that. <laughs> you're feeling superior. Uh, yeah, we got a big week in news, so we're going to dive right in because uh, it's going to be uh, it's just a, a thick, thick news week. Ooh, so thick. Juicy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you're making it weird. Weird. <laughs> Calm down. Um, Tuesday morning saw the announcement of the 96th Academy Award nominees presented by Zazie Beetz and Jack Quaid. Oppenheimer leads the race with 13 nominations, closely followed by Poor Things with 11 nominations. Killers of the Flower Moon received 10 nominations, and Martin Scorsese at 81 became the oldest directing nominee in Oscar history. Barbenheimer's other half, Barbie, earned eight nominations, including Best Picture, but director Greta Gerwig was notably excluded from the director category. Alongside Barbie, Anatomy of a Fall and Past Lives were also Best Picture nominations from female directors, setting another Oscar record. American Fiction, The Holdovers, Maestro, and The Zone of Interest round out the rest of the Best Picture noms. What do you guys think of these Academy Award nominations? 2023, Hollywood really came out with... uh a hot barrel from that post COVID slump. And we got all of these amazing movies and it makes the Oscars mm. this year extremely contentious, but like in the best way, because you have all of this, this awesome material to go through if you're, if that's your thing. And um, the, I will address the <laughs> elephant in the room about the snubs from for Greta Gerwig and for Margot Robbie on Barbie. It's definitely, um, it's definitely a miss. It definitely just shines more of a spotlight on everything that movie was about and is kind of disturbing and has seen a lot of backlash today when those uh, when that all came out today. So it's really unfortunate and um, hopefully, you know, hopefully we move forward and we do better next year. It is what it is this year, unfortunately. But uh, that being said, we still have lots of really awesome films to review this year and to look at and to see the different range of styles that has come through is also really cool. Everything from Barbie to Oppenheimer. I mean, it's the <laughs> Barbenheimer. There's, and then there's everything in between. And so um, I've had a great time watching a lot of these movies. I've got a few more to get under my belt, but I'm excited to see who really ends up on the top on all these categories because I think everything is just super neck and neck with every single nomination this year. Mm-hmm. The Barbie thing, I'm kind of hung up on that too. Like, I I think the optics of it are bad. That you are, it, it's nominated for Best Picture, right? And it's you've got a nomination for America Ferrera for Best Supporting Actress. The the not nominating Margot Robbie for Best Actress is. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But what makes even less sense is the missing of Greta Gerwig for 
best director. Like that mm-hmm. seems insane. Like that seemed like a shoe in. Uh, if you looked at any predictions that came out before the nominations happened, they would have had both of those uh, nominations as part of it. Uh, and so that was, it was shocking really. I mean, then that dominated the conversation. It wasn't the, the top trending topics today were Oppenheimer because of all the nominations and then Barbie, but it was all negative. It was like, what are we doing here? You know, like this was the most successful movie of the year. Uh, it was, it, like you said, Haley, it kind of made some certain points that are highlighted in a way uh, by some of these lack of nominations. And I think I, I, I wonder, and I don't have an answer to this question, but I wonder why it is like, I wonder what the, I wonder what the driving factor behind that is. Like, is it just that people in Hollywood are, old and they see a movie and they think, ah, it's just the toy movie. Or is it that they're Hollywood's afraid to reward success, which sometimes they are like the high grossing movies. A lot of times they don't, they, they do get snubbed at the Oscars. There's a lot of examples of that over the years. Or is it just the fact that like Barbenheimer happened and people thought, well, wait, you went and saw Barbie instead of Oppenheimer. And then they turned it around in the Academy Awards season and said, well, we're going to flip it kind of back the other way and have the awards go more this way instead of that way. I don't know. Like I said, I don't have an answer to that question, but I do wonder like, what is the root of that? Like, what is the root? Because that was an intentional snub, it felt like. And so like, what's the driving factor there? I think some of it is is definitely, as I think Haley highlighted sexism and like, lack of understanding of that story and all of that. But like some of it, I do think is an aesthetics thing that the Oscars has always had a problem with, which is like these pop movies sure. that are yeah. flashy and bright colors and all of that. Like the aesthetic of that movie looks like a kid's movie, but that's the beauty of it. And the like, the the beauty of it is connecting that like very almost childlike aesthetic of Barbie land with our real world and like drawing those connections. And it's done in such a way that's really impactful. And I think that's a harder level of difficulty than a lot of the ones that are in the best director category, where it's just like kind of paint by numbers. And it's something I think the Oscars is a problem with in all categories where they pay homage to making movies the way movies have always been made instead of, uh, uh, like respecting the trailblazers who are doing something new and different. And I am just always wanting, I'm always voting for the people who are doing something new and different because when I see a movie and even if it's very competently made, like to me, there's a difference between competence and like the best, you know, the best to me implies some, some sense of ingenuity, some sense of pushing the art form forward. And I think Barbie does that. Um, yeah. So I, I agree. It, I, I think it's, I don't know if it's intentional, but I, I do think it's a snub for sure. Yeah, bear with me as I I start by kind of like patting myself on the shoulder and celebrating a little bit of an achievement as a uh, self-described cinephile. This was the first year where all of the nominations, at least in terms of the best picture, I was actually able to see ahead of the nominations. And that was uh, the case as of this weekend. I got the chance to see the zone of interest. So in terms of the nominations here, I really don't think there are too many surprises. And I do think there were some good points made in terms of like maybe some of the staleness or the lingering staleness of the Oscars. But that being said, I do think the last few years we've really seen a paradigm shift where we're definitely seeing a lot more diversity. We're starting to see more inclusion from some more popular films. So to that end, I think Barbie has been addressed pretty thoroughly here. But I will say, you know, apart from the the sexism and just like kind of missing the point of the movie itself, I think even from a technical standpoint, I think I would have like just given the nomination to Greta Gerwig ahead of the screenplay. I think just from mm-hmm. like, you know, just an objective view looking at the movie, that makes sense. But um, outside of all of that, um, really nice to see Past Lives get a nomination. But, you know, and speaking of like poor optics, I have to be fully transparent here. As, as much as we've seen, um, you know, nice and positive trends in the Oscar space, I do kind of worry thinking about last year with A24 and everything everywhere all at once kind of sweeping the Oscars. The fact that this is an A24 release uh, featuring Asian leads, like I am a little worried that that may hurt its chances and I don't Mm. really see it taking home any awards. Uh, I hate that that's the case, but I just have to be honest. Uh, But that being said, I'm absolutely delighted that it got a nomination. Uh, Apart from all that, I will say that the best supporting actor category is absolutely stacked. Uh, 
Robert Downey Jr., it might be his award to take, but Sterling K. Brown is definitely going to give him a run for his money. And it's it's an absolute crazy year when I say that Robert De Niro is kind of the weak link here. And that's no no slack or shame towards him at all because his performance was awesome. But that's just how stacked that category is this year. Yeah, I think Robert Downey Jr., I think he's going to take that because ultimately, and I think there's a wider conversation there about how do you choose who wins these awards? And a lot of times you're giving the award to someone not just for the work that they've done, for what they've nominated, been nominated for, but you're giving them a career award, right? So mm-hmm. like you think about somebody like Robert Downey Jr., winning this award isn't just for his... You know, as much as they want to say, like, what's well, just for his performance in Oppenheimer, it's not. It's for his career, right? It's mm-hmm. for the turnaround in his career, the story that he is in Hollywood. All you know, he's not going to get nominated for like a Marvel thing, right? So it's like by kind of bringing him into the conversation with that in this movie, you're kind of giving him that award for his entire body of work in a way, kind of in the background. And to mm-hmm. me, that's what's sort of happening with Nolan a little bit here too. Uh, he will win that best director, uh, um, the the best director category, like a, just like a hundred percent. Like he's going deservedly to so, deservedly and, and so. so. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is because again, it's like his impact on cinema is huge. And Oppenheimer is a huge chapter of that, obviously. But when you're giving him that award, it's like you're sort of saying all of that at the same time. Um, and, I, and I think just from the, from the ground up, not even past that, like I think, he, I think Oppenheimer will win Best Picture, um, I, I think, just kind of looking at, at this. And, and I think by the time that that night is done, you've probably got like Best Actors, probably a two-horse race between... Um, uh, between Killian Murphy and Paul Giamatti, I would say probably, um, and he's probably taken Best Director. They're probably taking Best Picture. Like it's going to clean up at the at the Oscars, I think, by the time we get to the end of that night. I'll shine some more light back on the ladies because I think the Best Actress in a Supporting Role is really challenging. Other, I don't think Emily Blunt is in the race for this, but Danielle Brooks delivered an incredibly powerful performance in The Color Purple. America Ferrera has that incredible monologue that Greta Gerwig wrote for her that makes me cry every time I hear it. Jodie Foster in Nyad is just I, one of her best. And I, it was a kind of strange movie, but I watched it and it's amazing, the story of it, truly. And then Divine Joy Randolph and the holdovers, she's like the, the thing that keeps that movie together, keeps all of the characters. And so I'm like, I don't know. I, I, want, <laughs> I want them all to win. <laughs> but truly, it's like everyone, for everyone that wins... You have all these quote losers, but this year it's just like, is anybody really losing when you're you've made it this far with this caliber mm-hmm. of films that are stacked against each other? Yeah, I think Divine Joy Randolph's probably the front runner for that one, if I had to guess, um, at the moment. But the America Ferrer thing was kind of a surprise. Like a lot of people like just didn't expect that she would be nominated for that. So um yeah, that's a good call. Yeah. I, I I'm not surprised in that like I think that she of that movie, she's she she does this interesting thing of straddling the line between the real world and this sort of like <laughs> the the fantasy world in that movie is sort of in her head, and she sort of straddles the line between like drifting between like Barbie world and real world, and it sort of grounds that movie in a way. Um, and I think like that her and obviously like like Haley said, her monologue is 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 the key moment of that movie that gives it more depth than. Um, you would you expect that movie to have, um, and and yeah, I'm I'm I I hope I hope she does well. I, I hope I, it's it's hard because I haven't seen all of these yet. We are covering the Oscars over on Bingers Assemble. Um, Haley and Jay Scotty are, are and and me and Ashley are all over there uh, talking about the Oscars. So uh, if you if you uh, want to come hang out and listen to the Bingers Assemble, go go over there. We're going to cover every Best Picture nominee, and then hopefully. Um, it looks like we'll probably have time because a lot of the best picture nominees are in the other categories. So maybe we'll hit some of the actor categories that are lacking uh, that didn't make best picture um, to talk about those as well. So uh, we're going to get a, get a lot of Oscars coverage on Binge Assemble this year. I'm pretty excited about it. I'll tie a bow on this one with a final thought, if I if I may. Uh, we talked about a lot of records that were made with this ceremony, which was really nice. But it is worth noting that uh, John Williams became like the most nominated, you know person in film ever with like 50 some odd nominations with wow. his uh his best score for or uh 
his score for uh, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. And I just wanted to point out, like, Ludwig Goreson also got nominated for his score for Oppenheimer. And I really got to say, like, that score does so much for that film. And Ludwig has really emerged. Like, I think he really is going to, like, we're witnessing the the burgeoning career of a contemporary of John Williams. So, and the fact that uh, Hans Zimmer won the Oscar for Dune and he actually wanted to score Oppenheimer, but he had to exit Oppenheimer because of conflicts with Dune. So how cool would it be if Hans Zimmer won for Dune and then you see Ludwig able to win for Oppenheimer as well? That'd be a pretty cool story in, in my book. I think he will win too. Like, he he deserves he's, it. He's the clear, I think he's the clear yeah. front runner in that category. I'd be shocked if he didn't win that, yeah. that, uh, that award. Mm. Not to tie a bow on top of your bow, but I you. meant to mention <laughs> last week is that Elton John uh, became a in rarefied air. He he has the EGOT, so he has That's an right. Emmy, mm-hmm. um, a Golden Globe, an Oscar, and a Tony Award. And I was kicking myself after we recorded that I didn't mention that. Uh, so a legend joins other legends. Yeah, I'm still standing. <laughs> for, yeah, for our, yeah, our yeah. song tonight. <laughs> There's like a bow on a bow, like incep- Inception, <laughs> Christopher Nolan joke in there somewhere. I can't find it. I don't yeah, have the time yeah. to build it, but it's Award somewhere season in there. Inception. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to continue Bowception, I just wanted to say I really liked what um, Haley said at the very beginning of this, uh, talking about COVID, and this year does seem really stacked and very stacked in a way that's like very uh, varied. Sorry, that's a weird hard thing to say very varied um but uh the and i i i I always say this when there's these long strikes or there's these long um i think people have pent up creative energy that they need to expend and 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 covid and then the strikes and these things that like happen i think when you come out of those a lot of times you end up with this sort of creative uh time because people are ready to not only um ready to like tell the story they've been holding back on or they haven't been able to tell. But also um, some people realize their careers are shorter than they thought. You know, they, they realize, oh, I just lost two years of my career. It's time to come do some things that I'm really passionate about. And people uh, put out great, uh, great art in these times, I think. So I think this year is a really a representation of that. So it's a good, uh, I like that point a lot. Uh, got to uh, continue yeah. the Boception here. We got Jessica <laughs> Mai in the chat letting us know that the last time Downey lost Best Actor was to Heath Ledger. Oh. Oh, wow. Yeah, good call. Mm. Thanks, Jess. Okay. We're slapping a big old rumor disclaimer on this next one. <laughs> but Ryan Gosling has reportedly met with Marvel Studios' Kevin Feige to discuss p- potential roles in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, with one of the rumored characters being Nova. While it's still uncertain if official talks are underway, uh, Gosling recently departed from his long-attached Wolfman project with Universal and Blumhouse, raising speculation about a possible Marvel connection. Do we think there's a validity to this latest rumor, or is the internet living in La La Land? If true, where do we see Gosling's Kennergy uh, being best utilized by the MCU? I mean, you can give Ryan Gosling anything to do, I think, and he'll do it well. I think he's proven that uh, in his roles over the past handful of years. And this makes all the sense in the world. I mean, he's a huge star. Uh, You want to bring new faces in as you've had your stars sort of depart the MCU uh, towards the end of the long uh, Infinity Saga. You need to bring in new faces of of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So bringing someone in of the caliber of Ryan Gosling makes sense to say like hey what what ki-? and sometimes marvel will do this they'll just be like what role do you want to play like we have a few roles here we're going to pitch some of them to you and then you tell us where you think you fit uh, and i think that that does make sense i do love the idea of nova in the mcu i think there's a lot of uh, we've already had that character in a way teased with xandar and with the nova Corps, and so the pieces are there you could uh, foreseeably see a movie where you even talk maybe josh brolin into coming back as Thanos and you go back and you tell that story of the rise of that character. Right, and it yeah. seems like we're kind of getting far enough away from that to where if you brought that character back, uh, it would be more impactful, right? You know, people haven't seen Avengers Endgame for a little while. They haven't seen Thanos for a little while. So you bring them back, you do the thing, you tell the rise, of, you get that kind of almost, it sounds weird to say nostalgia, but we're getting to that point, right? Where like we saw these movies a while ago. Uh, and so to bring that character 
back in a way and and uh, tell a new story with a new hero that you're bringing into the modern uh, world or modern MCU, uh, I think would be really cool and really interesting. But ultimately, zooming out on it, I think um, Ryan Gosling makes sense. If they can, uh, he's a busy man, but if they can get him into the MCU in some way, even if it's in kind of like the Christian Bale, kind of what he did where he popped in for a movie and then he was gone, um, I think that's, it's a home run. Mm-hmm. I always think of Ryan Gosling as huge of a star in Hollywood as he is. He kind of likes to fly under the radar, like personally. Um, if you watch his interviews, he's he's kind of reserved. You know what I mean? He's a little reserved. And, and I just wonder if the MCU is too big for him. And like that seems stupid as he was in the highest grossing movie last year. But he had to really think about that and only in a very true artistic moment did he say to Greta Gerwig yes I'll do it after seeing his kids Ken doll in the ground next to the lemon uh which is amazing but I just I wonder if it's too big of a franchise for him even though he's been in huge films and he will probably continue to be I just don't know if I see him at that like Robert Downey Jr. level of wanting to do that press and the stuff that the MCU machine requires not saying I wouldn't want him in it because I absolutely would. It's just kind of my feeling on him as an actor. Hmm. I'm all for it. I, I, I know it uh, seems to be uh, pretty ubiquitous so far. I, I, I'm just all for it. I think he's awesome. I love him in a lot of movies. Um, and he kind of, I always, I'm always surprised by how much I love him. Like I, I, I think of, I think there's just like, the notebook still sort of like oh, in my head of he's sort of this like he took my take. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's okay, he he has this sort of like you know romantic comedy guy, uh, romance guy, and he's sort of still I think working to g- build up himself in other people's minds. Um, and I and I think he was perfect as Ken, and I think this is another step towards probably broadening his audience a little bit. And I think uh, th- there are other movies that do that. Obviously, um, Blade Runner comes to mind. Oh, yeah. Um, but I-, I think that was a little more niche. And this one, uh, the- obviously, MCU is the furthest from niche. And it could explode him in an, an entirely new uh, level in his career. I- I'd love to see it. Sorry, Jay. Scotty. That's okay. I've had a massive man crush on Ryan Gosling since I saw him in The Notebook. So mm-hmm. if you're a bird, I'm a bird. So that being said, <laughs> whatever Ryan Gosling wants to do, like I, I'm on board for. Uh, I will say Nova doesn't excite me all that much. I am familiar with the the comics character, and I know the the character serves a purpose, and you know is is has become more and more of a household name. But I kind of lean to what you brought up, Haley, where if he could like you know step into a role similar like something Christian Bale did, because I think you you look at Ryan Gosling's filmography. And I have to imagine like coming off of what he did with Ken, that's why these Marvel conversations are really, really kind of, you know, starting to dominate the conversation. But yeah, you, you look at his filmography, like something I think of like, you know, you, Matt, you brought up Blade Runner 2049, but I look back to like a movie like Drive, which came out in 2015, Mm. where he's really dark, kind of like this silent, troubled uh, protagonist. And like thinking about that, I know, uh, you know, Marvel is actively trying to cast the Fantastic Four and is Doom too big for Ryan Gosling? Maybe, but that's just kind of where my mind goes. I'm Ooh. really hoping that this Nova talk is just kind of pomp and bluster and the real conversation is for something a little more meaty and substantial because he's got the chops for it. Ooh, he has the chops, but him as a villain, he's just so darn charming, which is great, can be that's great. That's what you need for Doom. For, I, I, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. You're, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. And I, I'm. I'm I'm thinking about it, but I I also think of him as having a very similar energy to people, like the 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 way he can be comedic but still have heart behind it reminds me of people like Chris Pratt and where he fits. Obviously, he's a little more comedic, um, but like I, I I just see him as a, as a different vibe. But like, yeah, I'd I'd love to see him stretch and do different things. I haven't seen Blade Runner twenty forty nine. I have seen Drive, and he is awesome in that. Watch um, Murder by Numbers, which is the first thing I ever saw him in, and talk about Dark. <laughs> oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just since we're all naming movies, my favorite uh, of his is Crazy Stupid Love. He is, he's <laughs> love him in that movie. So good. I will say I'll throw a hat in the ring for a Nova. If it's not Ryan Gosling, I think um, Austin Butler would be a great true writer. Yeah. Mm. I like love that. Austin Butler. Awesome. Okay. 
The Hollywood Reporter broke the news that Universal is developing a new installment in the Jurassic World franchise. David Kep, known for adapting the original 1993 Jurassic Park and its 1997 sequel, is set to return to the franchise to write the screenplay with Steven Spielberg executive producing. The film reportedly aims to introduce a fresh storyline, potentially launching a new era for the franchise. While there's no word about whether or not previous stars such as Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard will return, are we ourselves ready to revisit the shores of Isla Nublar? Okay, say it with me, everyone. Dino DNA. <laughs> Come on, guys. We so many lines. This. We How do we this. know? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge Jurassic Park uh, fan. Uh, it's it's one of those franchises that's a little bittersweet because as much as I love it, I totally acknowledge that there really hasn't been a 100% good movie since the first one. They all have mm. problems. And while you know I, I can make some exceptions for Jurassic World and Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, Jurassic World Dominion just really didn't do it for me. I haven't seen it since I saw it in the theaters. And I, I think you know, my disappointment in it is a big reason why. So, uh, I will always, you know, have room in my heart for the Jurassic franchise. You know, my knee jerk reaction was like, do I want this? Is it too soon? I, I do think they could still benefit from taking a little bit more time, but we really don't have very many details. There's not even a filmmaker attached to this one. We just know that David Kep is coming back, which I think is great. You know, he, he really built a career for himself in the early 90s, like working on a, a bunch of iconic films. So uh, all of this, you know, sounds pretty good to me. I'll, I'll kind of reserve a little bit more judgment till we start to see who's attached as far as director goes. And then um, if we're going to get entirely new cast members or have some of the alumni return. So we shall see. Life finds a way. Something else the article mentioned was that they are so far along on the script that they're talking about potentially trying to put this out in 2025, which wow. means that they got to be like done with the script. If like you're because oh, wow. you got to think like a Jurassic Park movie. I mean, you need a lot of VFX work. Like you don't even have a cast yet. You don't even have a director yet. Like if that's your target, first of all, that's late 2025. But also like you are, um, you are. I mean, that's ambitious, right? Like you're looking down and saying like, we're ready to go. We got this script all, all, uh, all completed. So, I mean, they must've been hard at work on it for a long time. Um, but that means that clearly they've had a vision for this project for a little bit longer than maybe we realize. Yeah. That's wild. It's interesting when all last year we were talking about franchise films and how we think they might be dying and people aren't that interested in them, that they're going back to the well on one of the most iconic franchises in the world. It makes sense from, you know, like a business standpoint. If you've got Steven Spielberg attached, then you're probably going to have a pretty all right movie. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't generally put crap out. So it's like, I'm, I'm excited for it if it really is a fresh storyline because I do love the Jurassic you know, cinematic universe, I guess, is what we would be calling it. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Are franchises truly dead or not? Doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like it. <laughs> they will let them die. I, I don't think franchises will ever die because as long as they, I, I think that just certain franchises ebb and flow. And I think, you know, I think the, the Jurassic World franchise like the the next, I think it's a good time for a refresh because I think that last movie was really cool to bring in the old uh, actors from the original Jurassic Park and everything, but this uh, moving forward, I think is the right move. Like start something new, tell us a new story set in this world. And I, you know, we, we've talked about it cause we, we covered it on Binger's Assemble uh, years ago. And like, I just want to see smaller stories set in this world. Like I, it doesn't always have to be uh, the big park or whatever. There's just at this point, especially in where the story has gone, like there's so many stories opened up. So I'm excited to see it. Jay, are your kids, are, are they Jurassic fans? Are they old enough for that yet? I think that my kids who are very scared of things would probably not <laughs> do well watching okay. Jurassic Park <laughs> at uh, the current uh, yeah. age that they're at. Sure, uh, sure. But uh, in a few years, I think we could get there. But yeah, right now... Uh, that's uh you know i don't want to do to them what was done to me watching that toilet <laughs> watching the toilet scene you know whenever yeah. i was like five <laughs> and being scarred never go to a porta potty again <laughs> I, I still quote that all the time when you gotta go you gotta go but uh, the reason i asked that is just because i, I was thinking about it as we were all discussing and i think you can't discount like 
the the merchandising around this franchise. Kids love dinosaurs. I remember how much yeah. I love dinosaurs when I was a kid and how fascinated I was and how much I wanted the toys. So yeah, it's 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 going to be one of those perennial franchises that just you know mm-hmm. persists. Kids are having dinosaur phases long before Jurassic Park. I know that. <laughs> so, but, well, you know, saying, Jurassic like, Park just you know open Pandora's oh, box. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I wasn't saying you didn't know that. I'm just saying like that's the thing. It's like <laughs> it's like a it's like a it's it's a thing. It's a weird thing that like whatever five through eight year olds just like love dinosaurs yeah. <laughs> fascinated that these used to be walking around the earth and, mm-hmm. and and so i yeah i think this this thing has legs as long as they'll keep uh as long as they refresh it and make it interesting my kids had like an existential crisis on the way to kindergarten the other day because they asked me like about the meteor that killed the dinosaurs and they were like well when did it hit the earth and how did that even work like how did it kill everything and so i like tried to explain it in a kid friendly way and then i could hear the gears working in their Uh-oh. brain and they were like but what if that happens to us <laughs> <laughs> like what's stopping the meteor from hitting us now i'm like Nothing. well you know um Bruce okay Willis we're here get out <laughs> 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 Welcome to existential crisis. <laughs> it's like you're too young for this. I'm dropping off at school. This existential crisis is their teacher's problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lucasfilm has unveiled an action-packed trailer for the upcoming third seat, third and final season of Star Wars: The Bad Batch, set to premiere on February 21st with a three-episode debut and concluding on May 1st. The trailer teased the Batch's challenging quest to reunite with Omega, navigating threats from the Empire and seeking unexpected allies. The voice cast includes D. Bradley Baker, Jimmy Simpson, and Wanda Sykes. And titles for all 15 episodes were revealed, which are already fueling fan speculation and anticipation. How did this first look at Clone Force 99's final mission land with us? I have loved The Bad Batch. I love that it focuses simply on this team of, you know, clones that were not quite regulation. And so um, they still bring in some of the wider Star Wars universe, but they they mostly focus on this team. And it looks like this last season is going to be still mostly that. They're trying to find their sister, Omega, who's been taken by the Empire. Um, There was a huge, huge character reveal at the end of the trailer, which I won't say on here just in case some people uh, don't want to know, but it's a Clone Wars character. And because they they showed that character, I'm like, who else is going to be in this show in this season? (laughs) Like, it's so exciting as a Star Wars fan, especially if you love the animation stuff, to see those characters come into these other properties. Um, I am really really jazzed for this even though our our tech is gone but maybe he's not <laughs> don't mm. give me hope <laughs> <Don't do that. laughs> uh, yeah I, I echo all those sentiments it's just really nice uh, you know as, as a star wars fan i'm a little bit of anomaly because i'm a star wars fan and i'm an animation fan but i have committed the the big sin of not seeing uh, Clone Wars in its entirety and it's on the list it is on the list but it's just been really nice to like have this smaller story where I was able to watch you know the the four episodes of the final season of the Clone Wars and then and then watch this show and just kind of like you know be on this journey with this ragtag crew of soldiers and brothers that I've really become endeared to so I, I like you know having a, a smaller story that has an end in sight. And it seems like the stakes are really going to be raised um, in this final season. And I, I think that makes sense. Like this has been one of those shows where um, it really has done a good job of kind of towing that line for being entertaining for adult audiences, but also being kid friendly. And I, I think as you know, they know some of their audience has matured through these, these three years, I think they're ready to take it to that next level and kind of um, take it to the dark place that the galaxy really is at this point in the, in the saga. Are we going to see these characters, make the jump to live action you think like i think uh, as we're seeing the development of ahsoka and that corner of the universe we know ahsoka is getting a season two we know that these characters are tied to ahsoka through the clone wars connections and i I do wonder and Haley, you mentioned the character reveal like I, i do wonder if that type of stuff is setting up for these characters to make some sort of debut in live action as we move into the Filoni movies and the Filoni series and all of that type of stuff. 
I think it's a double-edged sword. Some people love seeing them go from animation to live action like moi, and some people are like, "Eh, I don't really like this transition when I loved these characters in their animated form, and I don't like seeing a human being try to encapsulate what I love about them in this media. So it's, it's a little bit divisive. I think you could see a few, but I think all is definitely not going to happen. Tamara Morrison's just like, call me up, give me all that money, just scan my likeness and pay me a gajillion dollars and you can use me as many times as you want. <laughs> Spoilers, the character was Jar Jar. <laughs> <laughs> and you were right all along, he was a Sith. Darth Jar Jar, right? Yeah. Don't like, lose our listeners. <laughs> The first gameplay trailer for Indiana Jones and the Great Circle debuted during the Xbox Developer Direct 2024 event on January 18th. Wolfenstein series developer Machine Games is set to release the highly anticipated Xbox Series X game in 2024, which features an original story set between the movies Raiders of the Lost Ark and The Last Crusade. The gameplay showcased immersive action, intriguing puzzles, and iconic Nazi punching. All from an unexpected expected first person perspective developed in collaboration with Lucasfilm Games and under the executive production of Todd Howard of Fallout and Elder Scrolls fame, the game will be exclusive to Xbox Series X and PC. Video game adaptations have been all the rage recently. Will the reverse approach work for the indie franchise or does it belong in a museum? Yeah, I found this story to be pretty intriguing because uh, I've been on record kind of talking about how I was an Xbox gamer for generations, and it's Mm -hmm. only been with this generation that I finally made the transition to PlayStation. And knowing that this indie game was on the horizon was 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 one of the ones I was worried about. I was like, oh, I really want to play this indie game. It's going to be one of the few Xbox exclusives that I feel like I'm really missing out on. Like, it's going to be the Microsoft's answers, answer to Uncharted and you know Tomb Raider and what have you, and then they dropped this trailer. And the second I saw it was first person, I was like, "Ah, you know, Xbox just doesn't get it. They can't win. Like you, you gave them this this golden gift, like wrapped and packaged, and mm-hmm. they just fumbled. It's like you get to play as Indiana Jones. You want to see Indiana Jones. You want to yes. see the fedora. You want to yes. see the whip. You want to see the leather jacket." Uh, so that was my knee-jerk reaction. But the gameplay, you know, it, admittedly, it does look cool. Uh, Troy Baker is is standing in for Harrison Ford. He's kind of the go-to guy when it comes to voice acting. And he's doing, you know, a serviceable job as, uh, as Harrison Ford there. And, and the more I thought about it, I can kind of understand why they wanted to take the approach to differentiate themselves from your Uncharted and, and, and what have you and not have to live in that shadow or be compared. But I do think it's just a misstep overall. So... Uh, uh, the fact that it's 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 available for PC, I, it does give me a little bit of respect for Microsoft. As much as you know, Sony is the one with the exclusives. I, I do have to respect Microsoft for saying, "Hey, at least there's still a way for you to play this game if you really want to, without having to purchase an entirely new console." Mm-hmm. I think this trailer looks amazing. I wish it were an Indiana. Like it looks as good as if this were an Indiana Jones movie trailer, I would be all in. Like it looks really great. Uh, all the like the tone is right seems really good the the act the voice acting seems killer um i'm totally in and it's set it's that time period that's just rife for lots of cool indiana jones stories um but uh i agree it, what are you doing what are you doing and i, I like you mentioned the uh, I, I thought of the exact same thing the tomb raider and the uh um oh gosh you just started yeah. Thank you. The Tomb Raider and the Uncharted franchise are basically knockoff Indiana Jones franchises. Like right. they are. It's the the person who goes in tomb raids and then <laughs> turns out to find some sort of mystical thing at the end of the movie. Like that's what all Indiana Jones movies, that's what all Uncharted movies, that's what our games, that's what all uh of the Tomb Raider. I think the most oh yeah, no, the re- most recent Tomb Raiders even end up mystical too like it, yeah. it's it's the friend the friend they are modeled after that and i don't think it would have been bad of them to just be like we're doing that but with the actual ip you've wanted from the beginning you know what i mean like give us a really good story with really good puzzles really good acting and really good uh gameplay in general make it fun but yeah the first person of it all disturbs me if i'm gonna play it on a screen but i will say i've been a little obsessed with getting a vr headset lately and 
<laughs> when I saw this first person, I was like, okay, if I'm playing this in VR, like if I'm able to use the whip, like actually like do the thing with my arm, I, I would be down for that. But I don't know about playing it, it with a controller in first person. Seem Maybe that's, I don't know. I don't think this is going to be a VR game, but it looks like it. The conversation around the expansion of the Indiana Jones IP is really interesting here uh, because you've got a movie which came out, The Dial of Destiny, and then Harrison Ford was in it. And then you've got seemingly a want to expand it with the video game. And it just makes me think and wonder that in a perfect world, I know that Harrison Ford is has made it known that he does want to move on from some of these characters that defined him as a, as a young actor like Han Solo and Indiana Jones, and that he wants to close those, those characters. But I think... The world is begging for another Indiana Jones movie with Harrison Ford and Kehu Kwan together, reuniting oh, and, and uh, bringing yeah. bringing those two characters back together. For I mean, we've seen as Kehu Kwan's uh, career has taken off just to the moon uh, over the past couple of years. Like the it, the time is now. Like this is what the people want. Let's get them together on the screen, whatever whatever it costs. Like just make it happen. Hundred percent in for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a good call. Let's do it. <laughs> And uh, we're going to go write our congressman about that. And we'll be right back (laughs) right after this break with lots of really a lot of lightning round stuff this week. Tons of great material after the after the break. So stick around. Welcome back to Multiverse News. We're going to get to our Spotify poll, but... Uh, beep, 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 beep. <laughs> uh, along the lines of our disappointment with the lack of nominations for Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie, Ryan Gosling released a statement um, just not too long ago about his disappointment. I'll read probably the biggest poll quote, which is to say uh, that I'm not disappointed that they are not nominated in their respective categories would be an understatement. And I think it's a really nice show of camaraderie that he put this it's a really lengthy statement if you want to find it um he does you know acknowledge his nominations and his appreciation for that as well as his kudos to america ferrera for her nomination um but yeah just obviously the whole of the internet and hollywood is buzzing about this so Mm. man stay tuned (laughs) i I mentioned it on an mcu cast earlier last week but we i watched a video it's like the i'm just kin song but it's it it's there's like a youtube video out there that includes a bunch of production uh moments and there's a moment of greta gerwig look she's behind the camera looking on at the dancers and like giving them direction and doing the dance and sort of like no you got to do it like this and it's just like (laughs) it was really inspiring to see greta gerwig like no 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 like having that vision where she's looking at the dancers and that's not her job exactly but like she's like no no like i need you to really pop that like do it like i I just really thought i I just imagined she had this vision and she's looking at these actors and actresses and going like no no this seemed very particular and just that little bit of moment made me uh think highly of her as a director because mm-hmm. I think her vision was very clear. It looks like America Ferreira also has kind of made a statement and I'll speak to what you're saying about Greta. She said, Greta has done just about everything that a director could do to deserve it. Creating this world and taking something that didn't have inherent value to most people and making it a global phenomenon. It mm-hmm. feels disappointing to not see her on that list. Absolutely. It's interesting because I, I completely agree with them and because I, I think the movie is so uh interesting and different but also as a sort of genre film you know we talk about it all the time how superhero movies and sort of genre films and sort of ip movies don't get nominated and so it's interesting that the two actor the actor and actress that are nominated to for them to come out and be like you know like (laughs) screw you academy (laughs) like that's bold of them honestly like that 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 could in i could see a lot of uh people who vote going like, well, I'm not going to vote for that guy. He's clearly isn't appreciative. You know what I mean? So they're kind of putting their money where their mouth is to say that. Uh, The anecdote about Greta Gerwig kind of directing the choreography there made me think, did we mention that Barbie got two nominations for best song between I'm just Ken and what was I made for from Billie Eilish? Oh, I mean, so, yeah. Uh, so, no. I mean, and they also got a nom for production design, I believe. Oh yeah, yeah. And I, I, you know, I, I would have thrown Dua Lipa's "Dance the Night Away" in there as well. I mean, that was mm-hmm. that was a bop. Like, yeah, yeah. And the Lizzo one too is really fun. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. and it's just I weird hear, and cool. I still hear that one at the mall, and I'll just be like, I'll just be like, oh man, where is where is this coming from? <laughs> <laughs> it got me again. 
Yep, yep. It's 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 killer. <laughs> I, but I I will say I'm just Ken is is oh, the yeah. is the one for me. Like I just love that song so much. And it's just I so weird. I don't know if it'll win, but I really hope it does because yeah. to me, like it created a cultural thing, and it mm-hmm. was such like a linchpin moment of the movie. Like that, yep. just like took the movie to this strange but hilarious level. And yeah, like I, I feel like if you're it depends on are you are you voting for it because you think it's the best song or are you voting for it because of what it does for the movie? You know, there's like different. Uh, you have to kind of decide what your rubric is, I guess. But yeah, uh, yeah I really like that being in there. I think uh, for for me, uh, I think it does the most for a movie that it's in. I guess. I'll hundred percent. I think it was it was either Mark Ronson or Gosling talking about this song, and he, he was saying that like it was just really bold of Greta Gerwig to be like. We're gonna put an eleven-minute song in the middle that has like, like a sh- like a guitar shredding dance break in the middle of like. It's so like Rogers and Hammerstein. That's what they used to yeah. do in their musicals. They yes. have these like fifteen-minute ballet breaks in the middle of their musicals, and that's like exactly what this was. Dream sequence is amazing. A hundred percent, and it's so uh, yeah. It it really elevates the movie in a huge way, and yeah, Greta Gerwig making that decision is amazing. <laughs> to like. They, like giving a, 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 a musician like, hey, we need this song and it needs to do this. And they're like, okay, bring it back. And it's like, it's 11 minutes long. And there's this huge <laughs> instrumental break in the middle with no words. And they're, they're just dancing. It's like, it is such a far out thing to do. It's so good. <laughs> Love it. Okay. And before uh, before we get into uh, into our Spotify poll, and our lightning round, Haley, you want to talk about a giveaway? Yeah, we have a Patreon plug. If you join our Patreon now, um, until I believe I said I'm going to draw names on the 9th, we're doing a kind of Valentine's Funko giveaway. There's a really cute four Funko Valentine heart with some mini pops in it. It's Marvel themed. There's Thor, uh, Carol Danvers, and maybe Hulk, and I can't remember what the other one is. But yeah, join our $4 paid tier for Patreon. You get giveaways like this that are exclusive, some of them, to patrons. Sometimes we're going to do a push like this for newbies and those who've already joined. Um, And we do exclusive polls over there. We interact with you. Uh, We think it's worth your $4 a month. Yeah. Um, Seriously, guys, it's a huge benefit to the show to support us on Patreon. Um, We're trying to grow this thing, make it bigger every week, and uh, put more work into it. So we appreciate all of your uh, your love and support over there. It's lit, as the kids say. (laughs) As they once said. Back in my day, (laughs) (laughs) it was just cool. (laughs) It was absolutely mental. Giving me salt burn flashbacks. <laughs> I haven't seen that one. You, this place mm. is not for you. It's a good movie. Did it get nominated? No. It, it was no nothing. Darn! I almost watched it last one. week, thinking it would get nominated. Nor did May December in the talk. Oh yeah. Moving on to our Spotify poll this week. Um, our Spotify poll was: Should we eat more Carolina Reapers on the show? Uh, and we had uh, we had three possible choices: yes, <laughs> no, and just Jay. Um, which I, I just yeah, I uh, sorry about that, Jay. I threw you on the bus a little you bit. Know, it's fair. It's totally fair. It's my I, I had forgotten <laughs> when I looked at. I always forget what I had put as the Spotify poll until I look at the doc for next week, and I'm like, oh yeah, I did that at three in the morning. Uh, <laughs> you were sitting there with that Reaper in your stomach. You're like, I want somebody else to know what this feels yes, like. Someone <laughs> else needs to know. And uh, so we had 49% of you said yes, uh, which is, is a just minority. Yes, there, you just the yes. Just not yes. Me, just 15% yes. <laughs> said no, but not too far second, 36% said just J. Do these, people, do these people like me or do they not like me? Like, I think that's the question. You know, yeah. Is that an indictment? Know, is that like a, we want to yeah. see you suffer? Or is that like... They want to be entertained by or you. Is it, <laughs> are you not entertained? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, no, I, I, I love it. Uh, it's good stuff. <laughs> It was it was a close call though. I feel, I feel like we almost had to have Jay eat a Carolina Reaper every week. Um, but <laughs> hey, you know, I thought about Spotify. sending them back. I don't think I'm going to. I'm gonna. I just feel like I'm going to need them at some point. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna do some. I'm gonna make some kind of bet, or something's gonna happen, and I'm just gonna yeah. have to have one handy. Everybody, text me your addresses. I'll, I'll make sure everybody has a bag. Um. <laughs> uh, I decline. <laughs> 
I'm not saying that in no situation would I never eat a Carolina Reaper, but I will absolutely not handle it as well as you did, Matthew Carroll. I will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was. Mess. I still can't believe what I saw last week. I, mean, I don't know. They, yeah, I don't know. It, maybe I got a dud. Maybe the next one will kill me. Like, can you buy them fresh? Because they were thing, dried, right? They were dried. So maybe fresh they'd be. Fresh would be worse because you'd have to chew it longer. So like I think, but I chewed mine. Like I really, I tried to get in there. Um, mm. But dried. They're supposed to be really concentrated, so I don't know. I don't know what's worse. I don't know about peppers. I will say, uh, someone posted on Stranded Panda chat, I think the next day after our episode came out, what is a Carolina Reaper? Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> which I feel like we maybe should have mentioned at some point, but it is a hot pepper. Uh, and so I ate a hot pepper, and I and they were, that's so funny to me. They like went through the whole episode. What are they talking about? What is he eating right now? Use the Google machine. <laughs> Use the Google. Just machine. wait till you hear about Google. <laughs> okay, a we're. Whole new world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still standing. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Their song of the night. Sorry. <laughs> lightning round time. You guys know the rules in the lightning round. Uh, I'm going to read a story. We all are going to claim that story by saying our name, and we are the one that gets to respond to that if we're the first one to claim it. And we get one rebuttal uh, per lightning round. So, and we're going to try to stick to it tonight because we got a lot to cover. You guys ready? Oh, yeah. Ready. ready. All right. A black and white version of Godzilla Minus One is arriving in U.S. theaters for a limited weekly run beginning on January 26th. Scotty, uh, I've been on the record about how much I love Godzilla Minus One, so uh, I was planning on seeing it again in the theater at some point. This is the the push that I needed. I'll check it out. Love it. True Detective Night Country lead Jodie Foster confirmed on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon that she was offered the role of Princess Leia in the 80s, but had to decline due to a conflict with a Disney movie she was already contracted for. Jay, um, first of all, True Detective Night Country is fantastic. So Mm. if you're into that, check it out. Uh, But what I thought was really interesting about this was that she was way younger than Carrie Fisher uh, whenever she would have been offered this role. I think she mentioned that she would have been like 14 or something. So clearly, maybe the original vision of Princess Leia was a much younger character than they ended up going with. Uh, So I thought that was kind of an interesting angle. Hmm. Could have this much younger, maybe, version uh, of, uh, of Princess Leia. We know how it kind of turned out but maybe this was a character that would have been seen as more like a like a little sister type character to luke or something like that Mm, that is interesting since free comic book day lands on may 4th this year may the 4th it only makes sense that a star wars comic book will be available as one of the free books look for free comic book day star wars darth vader number one by charles sewell and set on hoth at echo base Haley. I always like to shine a light on Free Comic Book Day because it's a really cool thing that I know we do in the U.S. I don't know if it's international, but if you're into comics, uh, you can go to your local store and get all kinds of free books. This is one of them. DC teased theirs, but they didn't release the title, so I'll uh, report back. Uh, According to a rumor substantiated by Diz Insider, the Diz Insider show, director Guy Ritchie has exited the upcoming Hercules live-action adaptation for Disney, citing a busy schedule and desire to focus on other projects. Haley. Scotty. I got her Haley first. (laughs) I really liked the Aladdin one. It's the only one I've liked, and so this is kind of a bummer. (laughs) Mm. Scotty. With a rebuttal, more like Jerkules. Uh, no, Hercules is actually <laughs> quietly. Sorry, been sorry. saving it just for that. <laughs> you said uh, it so stone cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, that that ninety eight uh, or ninety seven Hercules movie is quietly like one of my favorite, you know, uh, later golden age Disney animations. So while I, I the live action adaptations have been kind of hit or miss for me, I was quietly pretty excited for this one. I think uh, Hercules has some really, really great music. But uh, I I also enjoyed Aladdin. It wasn't, you know, perfect for me. I think the Jungle Book has still been the best of the live action adaptations, but Aladdin had a lot of good going for it, especially in terms of the musical numbers. So uh, Guy Ritchie's talented, but if he wasn't 100% in on it and not super excited for it, I, I think this is the best move, and hopefully they can find somebody with that same level of talent and passion. Mm. 
Kate McKinnon and Jemaine Clement have been added to the cast of Jared Hess's live-action adaptation of the Minecraft movie at Warner Brothers, joining an ensemble that already features Jason Momoa, Jack Black, and Jennifer Coolidge. Jay, quietly kind of a stacked cast, like Mm -hmm. Jason Momoa, Jack Black, Jennifer Coolidge, and uh, now Kate McKinnon. I mean, that's a pretty good cast for a Minecraft movie. This one's going to probably do like a Super Mario Brothers sort of thing and get all the kids out to the theaters, and we'll be talking about it cracking a billion dollars or something here in a year or so. 100%. Last week, Warner Brothers Discovery initiated the process of listening to pitches from writers for the upcoming Harry Potter series on Max. According to sources, Martha Hillier, Kathleen Jordan, Tom Moran, and Michael Leslie presented their visions. Additionally, the studio is open to exploring the potential for multiple projects within the new universe alongside the planned mainline series. Scotty. Uh, yeah, my anticipation for this series has not been uh, through the roof by any means, but I have been playing a lot of uh, Hogwarts Legacy lately. So the the kind of final note here about the uh, potential for multiple projects like within the universe kind of spinning off, like that kind of excites me because like had you asked me before, uh, prior to playing this game, like my uh, you know exposure to the Fantastic Beast franchise uh, didn't really do it for me. I thought it was diminishing t- returns there, but uh, it does seem like the the Wizarding World and the Potterverse still has a lot of uh, you know stories to to and history to pull from. So uh, I will be you know keeping an eye on this one. Marvel Studios is regaining momentum in 2024 with a strong start for its TV shows, shifting focus to Daredevil board again after the success of the Echo series. The series, which resumed production this week with a gritty tone, sees the return of key characters like Charlie Cox as Daredevil and Vincent D'Onofrio as Kingpin, along with retooled elements and potential reprisals of roles by Deborah Ann Wall and Eldon Henson, as well as Wilson Bethel returning as bullseye matt yeah get it (laughs) you saw echo i I like echo was we between loki what if echo and like some of the things we're hearing like i feel like marvel's really ramping up for a new like golden age of stuff like i'm really really excited and like if they lean in to the daredevil and defenders of it all with this spotlight stuff and that can cross over to the movies i think they it's a recipe for real success i really think that it, it is and could like win back all these people who are sort of waning in their interest because it's the thing I think at the heart, especially adults who love the MCU. I think a lot of the, the heart of that is the Defenders. Like we all love the movies, but I think the Defenders <sighs> elevates the entire property. Honestly, um, I love um, Endgame and but but and and all of these things in the MCU. I you know you all know I do, uh, but. I think the defenders just takes it to a deeper place in many ways and is able to explore the characters in a, in a broader way because of the time we spent with them and the darker, the ability to go darker in an adult series. So I think it could, I think kids are still excited to see an Iron Man and a Spider-Man movie. Uh, I think adults are starting to wane a little bit. And I think this could bring that, bring that back into alignment or something. (laughs) Up next, collaborating once again, Ryan Coogler and Michael B. Jordan are working on a genre film shrouded in secrecy. Information about the project is so limited, it has prompted interested parties and executives to visit the agency representing both Coogler and Jordan to obtain any available details. Scotty? I've really had my ear to the ground and my finger on the pulse for this one. So the, the secrecy and the confidentiality they think they have uh, may not be as uh, you know tight as they think because of the rumblings I'm hearing uh, is that it's a vampire story. So uh, not mm-hmm. uh, not confirmed in any way, shape, or form, but I could definitely see that. I think you know Michael B. Jordan uh, as well as as uh, Ryan Coogler, they both have a history of of picking projects that are pretty unique, and I think they always, no matter what genre they play. And they always kind of like uh, have a really strong desire to kind of tell a story through the lens of the black experience. So I, I have to imagine like this genre film will be no different. I could definitely see uh, if vampirism does, you know, pan out in terms of the subject matter. I could definitely see that working within their sensibilities. Interesting. Scooty with the scoop. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Also, I just like, I like that title for you. Scooty with the scoop. <laughs> 
Happy Death Day and Freaky director Christopher Landon is currently dis- in discussions to helm Big Bad, marking his first venture since his departure from Scream 7 in late 2023. Based on a short story from Chandler Baker, the film's narrative revolves around a family facing the threat of werewolves during a night in an isolated farmhouse. Scotty, uh, I don't really know too much about this one. I'm not familiar with the short story, Big Bad. Uh, I think, you know, it's kind of on the nose there in terms of the Big Bad Wolf, though. But Christopher Landon, I love everything that he's done. I was pretty, you know, disappointed for him when he had to depart the Scream franchise through no action of of his own. So uh, the fact that he's seemingly landed on his feet and has a project he's pretty excited about makes me excited. Delray Publishers is releasing Marvel's new What If book series, starting with a Loki and Valkyrie story on April 2nd and a Scarlet Witch and Spider-Man story on July 9th. Both books are available for pre-order right now. Haley. Yeah, I've got both of these pre-ordered. I really enjoy the What If stuff when it's truly What If Something Was Different, not What If we make up a whole different scenario, which is what What If Season 2 was to me for the most part. So I am excited to read them. What if Jodie Foster was Princess Leia? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Indeed. Double Emmy and Golden Globe winning actress Gillian Anderson has signed up to join the cast of Tron Ares, the third film in the Tron sci-fi franchise from Disney. Scotty, uh, yeah, slowly but surely this uh, third Tron film has third Tron film has really been building a pretty stacked cast. So uh, no word on who Gillian Anderson will be portraying, but uh, you know, I'm still excited for it. Sweet. The second half of Invincible Season 2 will debut on Prime Video on March 14th. With weekly episodes to follow, the second half of the season will include a total of four episodes. Yeah, Scotty, I didn't realize how much I was going to be speaking during this lightning <laughs> round. Four more uh, years. <laughs> four more years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, uh, yeah, the first half of Invincible was really great. I'm excited for the second half. They kind of teased uh, this villain that's being voiced by Sterling Kane Brown. So my expectation is that he will kind of uh, really come swinging in these these final four uh, episodes here. Mm-hmm. I guess my my will use my rebuttal. Uh, I just caught up. Uh, nice. with with this series um and it's great just like season 1 really really well done excited for where the season's going and uh some of the like it just it's it's an interesting great cartoon that asks sort of complex questions and um and and I can just really feel um heavy weight on Mark's shoulders and I'm excited for the excited for the last four an official casting announcement for the MCU's Fantastic 4 seems imminent Jay, um, this I can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> like, like if I have to, if if they come out again and, and there's rumors and they're like, actually, it all fell through. Now we're going back to the drawing board. Like mm. I eat quit. A Carolina I Reaper. Quit. <laughs> <laughs> like. I mean, we all remember the Adam Driver, Marco Robbie, Paul Mescal, David Diggs days, and now we mm-hmm. live within the Pedro Pascal, Vanessa Kirby, Joseph Quinn, and Ibon Moss Bacharach days. And who knows what our next uh, phase will be? That this if this will be a trilogy or not. But at some point, um, especially if this movie wants to keep its May 2025 release date, which seems impossible now at this point. <laughs> uh, they better get to it. So, um, yeah, this is just kind of like a people who are insiders are kind of coming out and saying, like, look, they got this cast. It's locked down. They're ready. They're just, it's going to happen soon. So that probably means, like, when you're listening to this, it was probably announced, like, two hours after we dropped <laughs> the episode because it's just kind exactly. of how things go. Yep. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> just, like... Just let's get this done, please. I'm, I'm <laughs> like the speculation of the fantastic forecasting. It's just I feel like there's just like my brain's just melting from my ears at this point, like thinking about having to do this all over again from scratch. Yeah, a thousand percent. Uh, we're like not even involved in the process. I can't imagine what the like producers or whoever who are trying to get this done are feeling like. I have a Marvel movie. Like, why can't we get this done? <laughs> oh man. Marvel Studios revealed several images for its upcoming third season of What If in a social media post thanking fans for watching the animated anthology series' second season in droves. Scotty? 
Gundams. I saw Gundams. Right? Yeah. What is that about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, t- I don't know. I don't know if they're Transformers it's probably or that Gundams. Michael B. Jordan is uh, producing that episode. <laughs> <laughs> probably Gundam vampires. <laughs> John Boyega is set to headline the ex- and executive produce The Book of Eli, a TV series prequel to the 2010 post-apocalyptic action film that starred Denzel Washington in the title role. Boyega will play a younger version of Washington's Eli in the project and the writer of the original film, Gary Whitta, uh, as well as its directors, the Hughes brothers, will executive produce. Jay? Um, the Book of Eli is one of those movies that um, I think has aged well um, and is good and still good and culturally relevant. Um, and I think at the time, it, it's a movie I hadn't thought about for a while until we saw until I saw this announcement. So I thought it was interesting to see that you know, 14 years later, 15 years later, they're talking about making a um, making a prequel uh, to it. So. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, like, uh, but I'm I'm down for it. Like, I, I like the idea of John Boyega being involved and and getting to executive produce. Um, I think it, it it encouraged me to want to go back and revisit that movie again. Uh, so yeah, I'm intrigued for sure. Mm. Scotty with a rebuttal. The the cynic in me has to imagine that this is somehow inspired by Furios. So like, they saw the trailer for Furios and said, yeah, <laughs> we want some of that. What's a poca- What's a post apocalyptic movie we got that we can do a prequel of? <laughs> <laughs> just pull one up. Oh, Book of Eli. Let's do it. <laughs> I don't remember much of Book of Eli, I, 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 but I do remember feeling like the world building was really interesting and good. And so, like, you know, I, I guess if, if they're going to have a world that's per, full of cool creativity, I'm down for some sort of expansion. Marvel Comics vampire crossover event Blood Hunt will be released with special red band editions while being called the bloodiest event in Marvel Comics history, according to lead writer Jed McKay. Haley, if you are a fan of horror comics and really graphic stuff, then I think these will be for you. That's what those red band issues are. And um, they're really hyping up this crossover event, this blood hunt. So I'm kind of curious to check it out. Mm -hmm. Netflix unveiled the full trailer for its live-action adaptation of Nickelodeon's animated series Avatar The Last Airbender, showcasing element bending and Fire Nation warfare. All eight hour-long episodes are set to premiere on February 22nd. Scotty, uh, less than a month to go. Yep, yep. If you know, you know. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I love it. Good job, guys. We 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 got through that lightning round. It was like two pages long, and I'm proud of us. <laughs> that was a true lightning round. That was maybe the most lightning, you guys the lightning <laughs> round that we've ever had. <laughs> For the most part. I think I had a couple tiny butts in there. Sorry. Uh, it started to unravel by the end, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Toward the other, a couple little... Well, it was mostly me. I'm sorry. I was the one that tried to keep us on. We were all I'd, guilty. I broke it. <laughs> Now speak for yourself. <laughs> spicy, your, Jay, take a seat. It's not your fault. <laughs> you spaced all the spicy stuff throughout the show, so I was able to simmer down between uh, between segments. Yeah, you, it could have it been disaster if you'd pushed them all together into one. Might not have mm. made it. Let's, 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 try, let's try to work on building a, a, J, a spicy Jay fire sometime. Like put all the logs just, really just so. Really worked up, Jay. Really work them up. If we end up getting a report that the fantastic forecasting is back to back to scratch, like just I'll put a mic in front of myself and just record. I'll just hit record and we'll just whatever happens, happens. <laughs> I love it. I don't even want to be here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, if if the fantastic forecasting does drop sooner than later, maybe we'll be able to hop back on and get a quicker an episode in midweek because we have been discussing that since like our first or second episode. Like we've been discussing that a long time now. <laughs> I'm really ready to ready to get it settled. Uh, so uh, we'll be back soon, guys. And uh, you know we, we mentioned the Patreon earlier. If you uh, if you can't uh, help us out by uh, being a patron, or if you can, if you already are a patron. Another way you can really help the show is giving us a five-star review or giving us a thumbs up in whatever app you're using. I looked at our reviews today. We have 72 reviews, which is awesome. I really am thankful for every one of them. Thank you so much. So many great five-star reviews, but there's 2,000 of you listening. Got to pump those numbers up. Come (laughs) on, news hounds. Show us that you uh, want the show to like 
keep going every week and like just throw lots of five star reviews if you can this week. Still your uh, still your family, the rest of the phones in your family, and hit five stars in their apps as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, whatever you got. Don't make do. it weird, but but yeah. Oh, yeah, I yeah, won't yeah, say I those of you that have not <laughs> left five star reviews aren't classy. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> but the ones that have may be classier. So. Spicy <laughs> scoots too. Um, all right. Well, uh, uh, Jay Sisson, tell people where they can find you online. Yeah, this episode is getting hot. We got to close it off. <laughs> Somebody gets burned. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you can find me at Commute the Podcast, a weekly educational show that comes out on Monday mornings, uh, where me and my co-host Dave uh, go through three interesting things in about twenty minutes. Um, so this week we talked about uh, how easy is it to hire a hitman? Uh, is a coin toss really fifty-fifty? And what happened to all the McDonald's play places? So uh, that's kind of the flavor of what we cover on uh, Commute the Podcast. So come check us out every Monday morning. That sounds awesome. Uh, Jay Scotty, where can they find you online, bud? Animation Deliberations, the podcast that takes action, animation, and cartoons seriously, but not too seriously. So check that out. And as we mentioned on the episode, the awards coverage on Bingers Assemble is currently underway. So check it out. Yeah. And Haley Hobbs, what about you? Uh, aforementioned Bingers, and of course on Source Pages, where we read comics and novels as primers for all the geeky TV shows and movies we love. Yeah. And uh, over, over on Marvel Cinematic Universe podcast, we had a really fun episode today that I just really had fun with. So if you if you want to go check that out, we we're doing a commissioned episode on basically trying to do our best writers' room on what a behind the scene, well, what a Avengers TV cartoon show would be fit in between the movies, and like it was a lot of fun. Just had fun. I always have fun being like creative with Jeff and just bouncing ideas back and forth. So. That was a really fun episode. If you get a chance to go check it out, uh, that's the Marvel Cinematic Universe podcast. Um, and we'll be back here on Multiverse News next week, if not sooner. If these uh, Fantastic Fours hold, we might be back sooner. Peace. <laughs> you stay classy, Multiverse.